Luigi's Mansion is one of those weird games where I didn't really think a whole lot of it back when it first came out, but the more I play it, the more I love it. It's a really good example of how an average game can age really well, in the same way that a groundbreaking game can age very poorly. I mean, the thing only really existed to show off what the GameCube could do. It played with light and shadow, it showed off those impressive particle effects, the detailed environments, and character transparency. At the time, it was an impressive piece of software, but it was an underwhelming game. The combat was repetitive, it was fairly short, and at the time it didn't really have much lasting value, but going back to it, those aren't really the things that make people love it. Years later, when you no longer have to view it as Nintendo's current big thing, you start to notice all of the nuances, the brilliant details that make Luigi's Mansion such an engaging experience. Years and years later, Nintendo would hire a Canadian studio called Next Level Games to produce a sequel on 3DS, and it was met with mixed reception from fans of the original. The gameplay did incorporate a lot of new elements, the variety of mechanics did make for better puzzles and more interesting ways to interact with your environment, and thanks to Next Level's brilliant animators, Luigi was made much more expressive and entertaining. But while it was a mechanically better game, it wasn't necessarily a superior experience. It just lacked all of those little things, like seeing Luigi's inner thoughts and the weird things around him, the dark and dusty atmosphere with that music. It no longer had those heavy strings punching you in the gut as Luigi's nervous humming would complete the song. <laughs> The animation was better and more expressive, yeah, but that didn't inherently mean the game had more personality. While the original had this entourage of unique boss ghosts that all acted and reacted totally differently, Dark Moon didn't have these, and what was left was the same mischievous personality in the standard ghost for you to see again and again and again. And the combat, man, it didn't have that same analog feel of the original, every tug of the stick rewarding you with those satisfying sounds as the enemy's health ticks down. Combined with some mildly irritating progression elements, like having a mission-based structure that sends you back to Egad's lab five too many times, it didn't have that same flow as before, so while the gameplay was superior in a number of ways, people began to realize that it wasn't the gameplay that made them love the original. There was a soul there, this charming secret spice that Next Level just couldn't manage to harness. And here we are with Luigi's Mansion 3. I was really happy to hear it get announced because there is a lot from the series I still wanted to see, but after hearing it was being developed by Next Level Games, the same people that did Dark Moon, I decided to be a little more cautiously optimistic rather than outright excited. I would hope for them to expand on the gameplay they made for Dark Moon, but also capture the personality and pacing the original game had. And after that E3 extended gameplay footage, it was revealed the game would once again take place in one single mansion and would bring back those boss ghosts, so quite evidently they were at least headed in the right direction. It's been a while since I've been this curious to see how a game turned out. Out, there's a pretty specific middle ground I'd like to see them meet, one that I'm sure isn't going to be terribly easy to reach, but based on what I've seen so far, I am quite interested in playing it, so what are we waiting for? The game begins with this beautifully animated introduction. Mario, Luigi, the princess, and their little toad buddies arrive at a hotel they are invited to for a vacation. I'd like to imagine this is maybe a little callback to the GameCube days where Luigi's Mansion began because the Mario game of that period, Mario Sunshine, began quite similarly with them going on vacation. Though I guess this time they actually invited Luigi. Poor guy got left behind last time. Everything seems to be going great. Everybody checks into the rooms without any problems. I really like how the title screen reflects that the first time you play. Play it, depicting the mansion as this glistening, wonderful, golden hotel. But anytime you play the game after this intro, it then shows its true colors. You can already guess what's gonna happen. The hotel owner turns out to be a big fan of King Boo and lets him out of his portrait so he can kidnap Mario and company. I mean, if her name wasn't telling enough, Helen Gravely? You know, like, because it's Helen? Helen? As in, like, H E double hockey sticks. It's now up to Luigi to make his way to the top floor of the hotel, defeat King Boo, and rescue his friends. Okay, first and foremost, we really need to talk about how good the animation in these cutscenes are. Like, oh my god, it is mind-blowingly incredible. Never before have these characters been so bouncy and full of life. The movements are so dynamic and all over the place. It has like a Hollywood degree of quality that goes far beyond what you'd expect from a Nintendo game. Mario and friends have never moved so organically, so naturally. I cannot stress enough how stunning this is. <laughs> Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Come on. Oh my lord, Charles Martinet gives what is possibly his most thorough and nuanced oh. performance in the entire series. Mario games are sort of notorious for recycling the same clips over and over, which, you know, makes sense because we're looking at characters that don't say that much more than wahoo, oh yeah, and let's a go. But while you are hearing those usual canned phrases, they never seem like they're from the same can. Every little sounds that come out of Luigi has this utmost care put into it. <laughs> the phrases and noises are similar and reoccurring, but the emotional range Martinet conveys with such a microscopic vocabulary, it's almost Oscar-worthy, dude. Oh. <laughs> I really love the scene right here, where it takes Luigi slightly too long to make the connection between the key and the door. Oh my god, this man's gonna melt my damn heart, dude. Uh, the interactions in this game are so adorable. Like, I don't think I have been this entertained by just watching these characters that I, I've known for 25 years now. There's so many brilliant subtleties in the facial animation, like how his eyes quickly dart to the ghost and back when he's trying to steal that button out of his hand, to the way he tilts his head and raises one eyebrow when watching Egad tinker with the bolter gust, to how in a joyous moment he'll briefly furrow his brow just for a second, feeling strong and defiant in a moment of victory. One of Dark Moon's biggest strengths was all of the personality in Luigi's body language and how he'd interact with everything around him, and I did expect a similar degree of quality here, but to blow that bar out of the water like this was not something that I was ready for. And once you're in control, it doesn't stop. Luigi's movement, the way you make him interact with everything around him, that level of detail is still there in real time once you're playing the game. And man, not just the animation and performance, but jeez, the way this game looks is on another level. A fitting coming from a studio called Next Level Games. They're certainly living up to the name with this one. These could very well be the most polished models we've ever seen in the series, at least in real time. The tech your detail is impeccable when the camera gets close and you can see every stitching on the denim in such clear quality. And the environments are no different, but it's the lighting and color that really brings the room together. This is easily one of the best looking first party games Nintendo has ever put out. Though I do admit that the areas seem to be a little bit too well lit. Like the atmosphere is phenomenal, but it's hardly spooky feeling. There's too many light sources for me to really buy that Luigi needs to be carrying around that flashlight most areas. After bumbling and fumbling around around for a little bit, Luigi will find his trusty poltergust and, along with it, a number of different gadgets to help him progress through the hotel. Pretty soon into the first chapter, you'll already be decked out with everything you had in Dark Moon, the flash to activate those green buttons and to stun enemies, and the dark light to unveil invisible objects. And once you've made contact with Egad, you'll learn even more abilities on top of that, almost like how Banjo-Tooie starts you with everything you'll learn in Kazooie before getting even more moves. First off, we've got this little boost move you can do by pressing both ZL and ZR together. You can use this to blast open certain objects, but you'll mostly use it for jumping over moving obstacles. And yeah, you will kind of have to suspend your disbelief thinking that like, Luigi can usually jump, but now he needs a backpack to do it. But I guess all I can really say is that while this is easy bait for a joke here, it's a different game, so get over it. This was the one move I always forgot I had. It's not used terribly often, so every time I needed it, I would end up getting stuck for a couple of minutes. What else do we got here? Oh, we've got a plunger. I mean, Luigi is a plumber after all. You'll launch this onto objects, grab it with a vacuum, and pull things away, or swing them around and smash them. This move is a great addition, because it's a lot different from the first two, so it adds a lot to what the levels can do. In Dark Moon, I often found myself just using all of the moves I had until I happened to cycle to the right one, but here the puzzle solving feels a lot more practical than just shining the right flashlight on something. I felt like I was making proper connections here this time. Like, I wouldn't look at something and think, oh, I have to use one of my items on it. I would see it and think, oh, maybe I can pull that down. And whenever I needed the black light, the connection that something was missing would have to have been made before I felt inclined to use it, instead of just aimlessly flashing it everywhere like I did before. But of course, the most significant gadget Luigi now has in his arsenal is Gooigi, an amorphous clone of Luigi made of this green... Goo. He's a little bit more flexible than the average plumber, so Gooigi can squeeze through vents, fencing, and a number of other things that Luigi either wouldn't fit through or would take damage from. You can summon Gooigi and then toggle between the two at any time by clicking in the right stick. It really reminds me of those puzzles in the Mario and Luigi games where you'd separate the brothers and swap between them. Make sure you stay away from the water though, that'll make him dissolve. Now doesn't that sound familiar? He's probably made from the same stuff that Egad made that paintbrush out of. I initially found the Gooigi puzzles a little bit underwhelming at first 
numbers. Earlier on, they're no more complicated than, oh, I can't do this, but obviously Guiji can, but as the game goes on, it does get better at combining the different abilities. It's then not a matter of figuring out you need Guiji, but a matter of interacting with multiple things in the room at once. The vacuum will once again get used in a number of creative ways, like swinging on vines, moving around objects, it works as you'd expect from prior games. Thankfully, aiming your gadgets controls just like the first game, using a right stick to tilt it up and down and to rotate Luigi. You never realize until you go back, but like, man, yeah, this series plays so much better with two sticks than it did with a one circle pad and the face buttons. Each gadget is mapped to a different face button, which can make aiming them while trying to use them quite annoying, which is why they're also mapped to the secondary shoulder buttons. L and R will use a plunger and strobe respectfully, and pressing both at once will use a dark light, so you'll be able to comfortably use everything in your arsenal without any complications, like resorting to claw controls. Though I did end up doing that a lot anyway for the dark light because I found pressing L and R together didn't always work for me, maybe it's my controller, who knows. Like you'd expect, the vacuum is also the main component of the combat. It pretty much works the same way as in Dark Moon. You'll charge up the strobe light, flash at the enemies, and suck them up after they've been stunned. But instead of charging up a powerful burst, you'll instead be able to slam the ghost into the ground, doing a large chunk of damage. This actually streamlines the combat quite a bit. You can slam into other ghosts doing damage and also stunning them without the flash so you can chain your attacks together to more quickly dispatch of groups of ghosts. It's kind of fun I guess, but it's not terribly interesting after a while. There's not very many ghost types at all here, even less than Dark Moon. And once again, these ghosts have that one note mischievous personality that wears thin pretty fast. The ghost encounters are much less frequent though, and they're a lot more short lived. The game overall has a much higher focus on exploration and puzzle solving than it does combat this time around. Which honestly, I don't have too many complaints about. Exploring this hotel is consistently interesting. The room variety is really impressive. No two rooms are all that similar. Even guest rooms with identical layouts are packed with furniture and objects that reflect the person who's staying there. Getting to rummage through EGAD's hotel room was quite a treat. You find all sorts of weird stuff. Mario apparently eats way too much pizza. That's a really fun detail they included. This hotel is packed to the brim with collectible cash, much like past games, but man, they really did a thorough job here. So many times I would be just screwing around, seeing how these different tools could affect the environment around me, and I was always finding different hidden caches of coins and bills and gold bars. While this money was used for upgrading your arsenal in the second game, here you're already fully equipped from the very beginning, which I'm kind of split on. On one hand, it made collecting the cash a lot less rewarding, but on the other hand, I can use a flashlight indefinitely right away instead of it fizzling out after one second, and well, that convenience I think is something I'd much rather over an upgrade system. In this game, the money is used just for buying one-ups and to learn locations of booze and gems on the map. I wish it did something a little bit more. It feels like this just isn't really enough to warrant like, hey, I want to get all this money. A lot of people will be happy to hear that the structure is much closer to the first game than it is Dark Moon. That annoying mission-based structure that had you going back to the lab constantly is gone. You'll now play through each chapter in one straight, uninterrupted shot, just like the first game. At the very worst, he'll call in to give you hints without pausing the game, but I never really found them terribly helpful, but even then you can outright turn that off. So first we had the Game Boy Horror, and then the Dual Scream, this time EGAD equips Luigi with the Virtual Boo. Okay, this is my favorite favorite one yet. It's a virtual boy, that's so cool. Just wait until I finish the marketing materials on this, it'll fly off the shelves. Oh my god, wow, they really went there, huh? Similar to the first game, each chapter takes place on a different floor. Once you finish the floor, you'll get an elevator button that takes you up to the next one. I love this idea of not being able to go to the top right away because the ghost stole all the elevator buttons. It's just silly enough to be perfect for a Luigi game. Each one of these floors follows your efforts to take down one of several boss ghosts, and this is where the game nails the personality. The floors all have a distinct theme. The first couple of floors seem like your typical hotel, but afterwards you'll find yourself on a Hollywood movie set, a medieval castle, dinosaur museum, an Egyptian tomb. They really went nuts here. They make excellent use of these themes too. The scenarios they come up with are so freaking inventive. Like the movie set, the blue screen being replaced with a digitized backdrop as you look through the camera lens, or moving around heaps of sand with a vacuum. And there is something about watching Luigi float around 
around in a rubber ducky life ring that I just can't get enough of. It's as adorable as it is hilarious. Fun too, using the vacuum to propel yourself around, it's super cool. The ghost you're currently pursuing will be fashioned after that floor's theme. Uh, the shopping district has this Paul Blart Renikoff dude, uh, the music hall has a Beethoven looking pianist, uh, we've got a film director named Morty, uh, what'd he make? Gadfellas? I like this gardener guy, he attacks you with a Venus flytrap, and then you gotta use this buzz saw to cut through the stem, that's really cool. You know, in an era where the Mario spin-off games often get sterilized into being as vanilla as possible, I really appreciate the creative freedom that Next Level quite evidently had here. Nothing feels like it's being forced to scream Mario. The designs are all totally original, allowing Luigi's Mansion to keep an identity of its own. I mean, look at that Venus flytrap right there. They very easily could have just made that a piranha plant, but the fact that they didn't demonstrates a confidence in this series piggybacking off of Mario as little as possible, and in forging an identity for a series, that is quite important important. Like the original Luigi's Mansion, every boss ghost will have a totally unique personality, but unlike Luigi's Mansion, none of them are minor fights. These are all full-blown boss battles, and a lot of these are pretty dang great. I feel like Dark Moon kind of flopped at the boss fights. Like, the first one was this awesome puzzle-focused fight that was incredibly satisfying to figure out, but all of the others were simply action-focused, one of which was even a turret segment. That was annoying. But in this game, there's a much better balance between the puzzle and action. Most of these will require a little bit of head scratch them before you realize what to do, and despite the sheer amount of bosses, they don't ever really seem to recycle solutions. One fight I needed Guiji's extra vacuum power to blow this projectile back, but that solution was only used the one time. Any other fight I'd need to figure out something different. The soundtrack will also reflect each floor accordingly. What starts as your bossa nova hotel jazz becomes a variety of moods and genres to match the environment you're exploring. One of my favorites was this swamp-themed banjo for the flooded basement. It's not really a swamp level, but the music still blends really well with this imagery of sewage and dirty water, and the total hick of a janitor that waited at the end. I mean, hell, even E. Gad's theme is a little different this time. It has this film noir vibe to it, and it's pretty freaking catchy. I love the soundtrack this time. It didn't really capture that same feeling I got from the original, but I didn't really mind this time, because what is here is sparking with a personality of its own, something that Dark Moon kinda failed to do for me. I kind of met myself with a pretty interesting stance here because I'm beginning to realize I didn't dislike Dark Moon's soundtrack because it wasn't like the first games, but because it didn't engage me like the first game. So while it doesn't really recreate the exact same sensation, it does still pull you in quite effectively. Dark Moon soundtrack was just this lightweight, generic orchestra. It didn't really have any punch behind it, but Luigi's Mansion 3, however, it does have punch. A different kind of punch, but a punch nonetheless. It's kind of interesting because there are a number of things I loved about Luigi's Mansion 1 that still aren't here. You don't have that camera to analyze objects and hear what Luigi thinks of them, and Luigi's humming still doesn't complete the song. Yet, I didn't find myself really missing those things as much this time, and I think it's because while with Dark Moon, there clearly was a void that I, at a subconscious level, desperately wanted filled, Luigi's Mansion 3 does fill that void, just in a different way. I began to realize that it wasn't just hearing his thoughts that I missed, but that intimate connection Luigi consistently had with his environment. And it's delivered in a different way here, but it is in fact once again here. I mean, of course I would have still loved for them to bring that back, it was a great feature, but the game manages to be engaging like the first one because it does have have a secret spice. It's a different secret spice, Next Level has their own recipe, but they figured something out here that they could not before. It's not quite your mom's home cooking, but it's something you will love similarly. If you play this game and you're not completely washed over with this absolute joy, man, I don't even know what's wrong with you. I know I already gushed about this earlier, but god, the animation team deserves like a lifetime achievement award, and Charles Martinet, god, he deserves like a thousand and hugs for making this character the most lovable idiot in the entire universe. Even Egad is more expressive than he's ever been before. The way he runs is so good. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, final boss real quick, so if you'd like to skip that, here's your chance. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's go. 
So, of course, it's King Boo. We all saw that coming, but man, I don't know, I was really hoping for some sort of surprise. You know, like when they hit us with that fake out in the first game, Bowser comes out of nowhere, but it turns out to be a suit, right? It was predictable that the villain was, you know, something from Mario, but it was still something a little bit unexpected. I don't know, I felt the setting here was just a little lacking. Like, yeah, we're on the roof of the hotel, and that's cool, we climbed all the way up here, and here's the final battle, but I don't know, I was just hoping for something a little more uh, surprising. Like, what if they brought back... Uh, uh, Fawful or something like that. That's something nobody would have expected. I mean, the little dude's practically a beanish version of EGAD anyway. He looks somewhat similar. He's got similar gadgets, similar intellect. Uh, what if the two were rivals all along, like in college or something? And the whole release of King Boo was devised by Fawful as revenge for... Egad giving him a swirly in school. I don't know, something like that would have been cool. That ending is so heartwarming, though. Seeing Luigi reunite with his friends is wonderful enough, but when the ghosts realize they no longer have a home, so they build them a new hotel? Oh man, god, this game, it is playing my heartstrings like a harp. I love this ending. Way to go above and beyond. Well, that was a good-ass game, holy crap, like, if I did have anything to criticize, though, uh, there is a little bit of backtracking at two points, you gotta chase this cat through older areas, and it did strike me a little bit as filler, but the character interactions are still pretty entertaining, so I didn't mind it too much. One thing I did notice, though, especially during boss battles, is that the game was, like, too afraid of being challenging. Anytime I was getting my butt kicked by a boss because I hadn't learned the attack patterns yet, the game was too afraid to let me die and start over. It instead keep throwing hearts and hearts and hearts at me to make sure I would not run out of health. It pulls its punches during the boss fights, and I think they could have done without that. The bosses also don't have those fun descriptions you can read anymore. It is just a minor thing, but it would have been really cool to read a little bit more about each one of these guys. Oh, and is it just me, or did the boost feel like a total afterthought? Yeah, like I made it through this entire video without even really talking about them, because they're barely even present. Only one. One! Only one you actually have to get through normal story progression. All of the rest are only obtainable by optional backtracking you have to go out of your way to do. They do still have those fun boo puns, but god, every encounter is exactly the same. They all have the same amount of health, the exact same behavior, and they take like no time at all to catch. It really feels like they finished this game and went, oh no, we forgot to put in the boos, and then they rushed them into the game at the last second. Boo hunting in this one, pretty disappointing. But of course, while these are legitimate things I do really wish were better, none of them really take that much away from how fantastic a game this is. Oh, I freaking forgot this game has multiplayer. Okay, let's try these out. There's two extra modes for multiple players. There's Scare Scraper and Scream Park. Uh, let's start with Scare Scraper. You'll have to climb up a tower floor by floor, each one giving you a different objective that you and your friends will complete under a certain amount of time. It's pretty challenging too. You guys gotta be pretty organized and on the ball if you're gonna get all this stuff done before that time runs out. Uh, these goals range from defeating all of the ghosts on the map to collecting a certain amount of money or rescuing a couple of toads. Well, I definitely like it a lot more than I did in the 3DS version, probably because of the better controls and the wider moveset. Uh, there's even a unique boss fight for it, which was pretty cool, even if it does just recycle moves from the story mode. It's a pretty nice distraction. I could see some people getting decent mileage out of it if you got some friends to play with, especially if you like the 3DS version. You'll love this one even more, but it's not likely something that I'm going to put a ton of time into. Next, we have Scream Park, a series of mini games that retools some random mechanics that showed up in the story. Uh, remember those Kirby mini games you play with friends because you just literally had nothing else to play with them? It's pretty much just Luigi's version of that. Nothing to really write home about. So yeah, Luigi's Mansion 3. It's kind of fantastic. I really did love and enjoy playing through this game. I, I do think it is that great middle ground between 1 and 2 that fans of both are definitely going to love. It definitely doesn't capture the same soul the original game had, but I'm beginning to realize how that's not all that important. What is important is for it to have a soul at all. It's not the same soul soul, but it's a soul that Dark Moon couldn't quite forge. It's not everything I wanted from Luigi's Mansion 3, it's most of what I wanted, and a bunch of stuff I didn't know I wanted. Next Level Games did an incredible job with this game. It made me fall in love with Luigi's Mansion all over again. Not for the same reasons I grew to love the original, but for brand new reasons that a talented team poured countless hours of tender love and passion into. It's a perfect length too, not too long and not too short. 
clocking in at about 13 hours. At least that's what it took for me to get through it. Whew, I was a little worried this was gonna be Dark Moon all over again, but it seems like they were listening to feedback, and in doing so, they made something truly special. Again, it's not like the ultimate Luigi's Mansion game. I still think there are some things here that I would have liked to have seen that weren't in it, but either way, it's still a pretty dang good Luigi's Mansion game. Objectively speaking, it's probably the one that has the best balance between great gameplay and great personality, so yeah, it's definitely a must-play. Not just for Luigi's Mansion fans, but for Switch owners in general. <laughs>